Well, we continue to press on to maturity, and we are in Hebrews chapter 11, and there's a lot of things in Hebrews chapter 11. The envelope structure that we are talking about is those who have faith preserve their souls, and it is the who had faith who were able to persevere with patience and obtain for themselves the blessing in the end. And uh, we read at the start of this in Hebrews 10, 35, and 36, Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And this is the summary of everything you read in Hebrews 11. And in the closing verses, we read these kinds of things, this that's on the board right now is actually 12.1, but it starts back at 39. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This also is speaking about our need for endurance, that we might obtain the blessing, that we might obtain the promise, even though we may have to give something up here. So inside of that envelope structure, you have a few different ones. Uh, We spoke last time about seeking a homeland, and we speak this time about the resurrection. But as you can see, these are... um, These are basically first principles. We have to be looking for God and for a spiritual home, for solace in the spirit, for peace with him. Uh, We have to believe that God raises the dead. We have to leave the world behind and to go about conquering in life, overcoming sin, overcoming death. They're really pretty fundamental. But that's the introduction uh, idea or a reminder, I guess, of our structure where we are. So here we are in Hebrews 11 at 17, the first example of resurrection is Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice the way that God told him to do in Genesis chapter 22. But Hebrews records it was by faith that Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac And he who had received the promises, or I should say even he who had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. The significance of this is to say, he has only the one by promise. He has only the one that God gave them miraculously. And this is the one that God already told him through this one shall your seed be named. He's the, he's the, the, uh, the heir, the, the line of inheritance. But God tests him and says to offer him up. And so here he is in Genesis 22 doing so, obeying what God said, even though that's the only one he has and the promise is supposed to come true, uh, come true through him. How could he do that is the implied question. Well, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So raising him from the dead is the answer. And it says he considered that God was able, really, uh, well, this word is kind of like reckoned uh, or figured. And that's an important thing because faith means reckoning. Uh, Faith means considering, reasoning, figuring. You're supposed to put things together. You're supposed to draw conclusions by faith. And this one drew a conclusion, Abraham did, that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Well, figuratively, because Isaac did not, in fact, die at that moment, but in the sense that he offered him and Isaac was as good as dead in the eyes of Abraham. Well, he got him back too. He expected that God was going to raise him. And we know this because of what is recorded there in Genesis 22. Uh, 
Among the details of this account is the most important one. Verse 5, Abraham said to the young men, the traveling, uh, you know, uh, the crew, (laughs) stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So it's subtle, but it's there. He said, the boy and I will come again to you. But we know already because of what the verse is leading up that he was intending to go up to that mountain and offer Isaac in sacrifice. So from this, you can conclude that Abraham figured God could raise him from the dead. And why not? Perfectly reasonable because God gave him a son when he was a hundred and Sarah ninety. Why should we think that resurrection is impossible for God? Nothing is impossible for God. But that reckoning, that figuring with faith means we, we trust God. We don't think that he has some ulterior motive or that he uh, is not trustworthy or is trying to trick us or anything like that. Even though we don't maybe know how or how it will be, we trust him when he says so. It will be. And you draw a different set of conclusions, the right kinds of conclusions, when you think that way. That's faith. Your your trust is in him. So this one drew the right conclusion, and it's true God can raise the dead. And figuratively, he did receive the boy back that way. The boy Isaac himself grows up, has his own children, Jacob and Esau. And we're told in Hebrews 11.20 that by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Meaning he saw a future. There was something else coming that he knew about. But I think this one's a little more subtle. Yet there is a theme. So here... What we read is Genesis 27 on this matter. Genesis 27 is where Jacob comes in pretending to be Esau and obtains for himself the blessing of the firstborn, which had been intended for Esau by the father Isaac. But you and I know And it's clear from what has been revealed in the text that Isaac also knew Esau was not the child of promise. Jacob was the child of promise. And it was through Jacob that he would be numbered. So in his intention to bless Esau, he was defeated. Uh, We don't say that Jacob did right deceiving his father or lying about this, but we do say that God's will nonetheless was accomplished in that he said the lineage is Jacob. And when Abra- or I'm sorry, when Isaac tried to controvert this in the flesh by trying to give his blessing to his older son, he was defeated in that purpose. And the blessing went to Jacob anyway. You can see that Isaac had no intention of doing so. When Esau comes in and says, it's me, Isaac just gave out Esau's blessing, so now he's trembling violently. Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate it all before you came, and I blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. So he recognizes now, it is the will of the Lord. The significance of what he's saying here, he already told Esau, I blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed is adding something to it. He realizes now, isn't this what God said? That's what he's saying. I can't do anything about this. It's in God's hands. Right, the 37th verse, Isaac answered uh, Esau, Behold, I've made him Lord over you. All his brothers I've given to him for servants. And with grain and wine I've sustained him. 
What then can I do for you, my son? There aren't other blessings in the Lord. Uh, there, are, there aren't other blessings, you know, other than those that are in the Lord. And this is the blessing. And it's been given to the other one. This is by faith. Isaac now re- sees, I, I'm not going to win the fight with God. What can I do for you? Well, not much for Esau. He does become a great nation, an independent nation. That's all that he can do for Esau, and that's what he did do for Esau. But you find in the 28th chapter especially, this is where you begin to understand what we're saying is not just supposition between the lines. It really is where Isaac has come to understand. As you find in the 28th chapter, as it continues, that he begins to tell Jacob, you need to go get a wife from your father's family, not from this place, Canaan, where we are. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. See, Isaac knows. He knows what what this is about and where they came from and what he was supposed to do in terms of the blessing. And he accepts that God has defeated him in his purpose. And knows quite well what this blessing is. And that Abraham had that promise. And that it was handed down to Isaac. And that he now hands it to Jacob. Who will take possession of the land of your sojournings. God gave it to Abraham. This is faith. He trusts the Lord now. Not that he wasn't faithful before. But at least in this matter. He was trying to go about things the earthly way. But that is faith. He sees it now. He understands it now. And he embraces this and he goes and gives Jacob the full blessing of Abraham. Jacob, for his part, goes on to bless grandchildren. Now, as we get to thinking about this, you know, all of these are... uh, having to do with the generations, right? But the parents and their children after them. And there's a there's something over them, you know, in this case, the promise to Abraham of taking this land that is bigger than any of them. But they all are looking at the same thing and they see that coming and that's what they're living for and that's what they're preparing for. Uh, it's also the case that these parents and and children are at issue in every generation. And there's trouble trying to get this blessing passed to the next one in every generation. There's trouble around it. In Abraham's case, he was supposed to kill the one that was to be the heir. Uh, As we just saw with Isaac and uh, Jacob, there was that fighting between Esau and Jacob and Isaac's own personal uh, desire to bless his older son whom he favored made trouble. But as you think about it in in that way, you've got to understand these are not about family dynamics and how to be a good or a bad father or mother or whatever. That's not what it's about. This is given to us in this way because it's resurrection. Every time it looks like it's beaten or defeated or has no hope, but somehow it works out the way that God said it was going to work out. And whatever seemed improbable or impossible turns out to be actually what happened. That's resurrection. But now Jacob blesses his grandchildren we read in Hebrews eleven twenty one 21, by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And it's true, Joseph had sons while he was in Egypt. And you read it in Genesis 48, which we will do now at some length. 
Genesis 48, verses 9 to 11. Joseph said to his father, These are my sons whom God has given me here. He said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. Israel, the other name of Jacob, you may recall, so that he could not see. And I've highlighted the fact he could not see, because there's also a very literal point being made. (laughs) Um, Faith is not sight. Remember in the New Testament we read, we walk by faith and not by sight. When Jacob was blessed by his father Isaac, it, it was because Isaac couldn't see. And now Israel, or I'm sorry, well, it is Israel, is is blessing Joseph's children, but he also cannot see. What about Abraham? Well, Abraham doesn't know how it's going to work out. And as they're ascending the mount, it says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and behold. All right, this is what, what happened when the time came. God provided an an alternative, provided an offering. But it wasn't something that he could see because of the matter at hand. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there was that blessing. So there is a thing here about not being able to see that is a component of faith. We trust God concerning things unseen. Now, continuing here in Genesis 48, Joseph therefore brought them near, and uh, Jacob kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and behold, God has let me see your offspring too. Yes, he's blessing grandchildren. He thought Joseph was dead, remember? They let out that he was dead. They lied about it. It wasn't true. And he said, I never expected to see your face Behold, God has let me see your children too. It's a fascinating thing when you think about it, but isn't it a resurrection? He thought Joseph was dead, but he wasn't. And so he is greatly blessed and he is back. He has his son back. And indeed, not just his son, but also his son's offspring. Now, if you know, if it isn't clear to you that this is about the Lord God and his son Jesus, and we are the offspring of that effort. You know, I don't know how to help you, but that's what this is really about, isn't it? So in Genesis 48, when it comes to the blessing itself and leaning over the staff, you know, what we find is this. In the 14th verse of Genesis 48, Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger and his left hand on the hand, on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So Joseph had taken pains to put the firstborn, uh, to align the firstborn on uh, Jacob's right knee, right, and, and the younger on Jacob's left knee, so that the hands would go there. And Jacob crossed his hands, to bless them. He purposefully put the right hand on the younger son. But he also, in so doing, made a cross. And there's a blessing in the cross in which the younger overtakes the older. The second overtakes the first. When Joseph, however, saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head, telling him, not this way, my father. (laughs) This is exactly what Isaac had done. I want to bless the first one. For that matter, it's what Abraham had done. He had Ishmael by Hagar and no hard feelings for Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. But the promises to the other one. This one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. His father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. 
I, I know the rules of the world. You don't have to tell me, you know. <laughs> it's interesting because the whole thing is, is questioning faith, right? It says, well, I know your sight, eyesight is dim. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he doesn't realize he's blessing the wrong one, right? Which all of it is, is just hubris. That, that's, that's Joseph thinking that he knows when he doesn't. <laughs> I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people. He also will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his offspring will become a multitude of nations. So, yeah, it has to be done the way God said so. That's all we're getting at. So in the 21st verse, Joseph, or I'm sorry, Israel says to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. So this blessing comes with an understanding that there is a future in which they're coming back to this land. At, the, at this point in Genesis 48, of course, they're in Egypt. And they're pretty comfortably ensconced in Egypt because Joseph is the right-hand man for the Pharaoh, and the people live in Goshen, the, you know, the finest, the fattest part of the land. But they're going to leave. In fact, the next thing that Hebrews 11 records for us is verse 22. That Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So he, who was the right-hand man of Pharaoh, said to them, You will leave from here. And he gave directions concerning his bones. In Genesis 50 is where it is recorded in the 24th, 25th and 26th verses. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then he made the sons of Israel swear, that is to say his other brothers. God will surely visit you and you will carry up my bones from here. He made them swear that they would carry him out of Egypt when they leave. So Joseph died at 110 years old. They embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Well, we know well what that means. He was made a mummy. And if they embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt, that means that he is preserved. For millennia, that body could be preserved, depending on conditions, of course, but basically, he's preserved. His body was still with them hundreds of years later when they did leave Egypt. And they did take his coffin with them when they left. In Joshua 24, in the conquer, conquering of the promised land, you read about this in the 32nd verse, as for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. So there was a plot of land in the promised land that Jacob had acquired with money, paying full price, wanting to owe nobody anything. And this is where Joseph was buried, in the promised land, which is a reference to Genesis 12. Verses 6 through 7. Abram passed through the land of Canaan to the place at Shechem, the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. 
So now they're back. That's what's happening. Hundreds of years later, yes, but they're back. And this, all of it, is resurrection. Joseph, yes, he died and he was buried, but he was taken out of the grave and he was taken to the promised land in fulfillment of the promise to Abram. This is about us. We have a resurrection from the dead in Christ Jesus too. And we also, though we may die, yet we shall live in him in a land that we don't know in a time that is beyond our lifetime. But we must persevere in this world to overcome and to obtain it. Now, the next thing in Hebrews 11 is Moses. It's the last thing, too, that we're looking at here today. The last example is Moses being hidden in Hebrews 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So it's by faith that they did this. They trusted God, and because they trusted God, they hid the child Moses, unafraid of Pharaoh's command. What was that? Well, it's recorded for us in Exodus. We'll go back to Exodus now in chapter 1. At verse 8, it says, There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And that's one of the best summaries (laughs) in all of history. 22nd verse, Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. That was the commandment, was they were going to exterminate the Jews. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, or took as wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And this is how Moses survives. What happens after this, of course, is that the daughter of Pharaoh finds this child and adopts him. And all of a sudden, the Pharaoh who wants the Hebrews dead is now a Hebrew grandpa. (laughs) But this is resurrection as well. Three months he's hidden, but he can't hide any longer after three months. You know, now that the child is old enough and noisy enough and mobile that you can't just keep him tucked away in your garments. (laughs) She took him a basket of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch, put the child on it, set it in the river. What is this? Well, it's an ark. It's Genesis 6, 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and out with pitch. That's what it is. She put Moses into the ark so that he could survive the trial and come out on the other side safe, which is resurrection. First Peter 3, 20 and 21 says that in the flood of Noah, in the ark of Noah, Eight persons were saved through water, and corresponding to that is baptism, which now saves you. It is a resurrection of the dead when you obey the gospel in baptism, in water. You're obeying God and being saved from your sins, putting to death the old person of sin and being resurrected in the spirit, a new person in Christ Jesus. That is a salvation from the death sentence of this world and of our wrongdoing in the times past. 
This is what happened for Moses. He was saved in the ark. And everybody is saved in the ark, spiritually speaking, because the ark today is baptism in the name of Christ Jesus. This is how we put to death the old person and are resurrected a new person. And this resurrection from the dead is a fundamental principle of the faith. You have to believe that God raises the dead. On the one hand, nothing is too hard for God. On the other hand, it means that God can save even me. Death is the worst condition, right? Whatever ailment you may have, and there are bad ailments, I don't mean to minimize anybody's plight or suffering, but whatever ailment you may have, as some people say, hey, how are you doing today? I'm above ground. <laughs> well, it's true. I'm above ground. You're not dead. Death is the farthest extent. It is the worst possible physical condition for any person. And God overcomes it. However bad we might think that we are, or however far gone or lost, you know, God can save. That's not an issue. He has the power to save. He has the power to raise the dead. He delivered Noah and his family through the flood from an entire world of ungodliness. It was so bloody and violent that he flooded it, just obliterated the place and started over with a family of faith in Noah. Well, your, your life may have some really bad things in it, but you can be forgiven in Christ Jesus who died that we all might have forgiveness for the terrible things that we have done in the past. Are you yet a child of God? Do you understand the power of the resurrection of God? Yes, it's by faith. We trust him that it is as he says. We trust him that there is a heaven and there is a hell. We trust him that there's life after this and that we will reap a reward in due time. If you trust him and you have not been reconciled to him, it's time. You know, repent of that sin Obey God for forgiveness. We have water here. Child of God, if you have fallen away from him, repent. Turn from that wrongdoing and come back to him, please, that you might be saved, that we might build each other up. We'll pray for one another. We'll gladly honor uh, any request for your prayer, uh, for prayer for, for you, for your spiritual strength, for you to overcome. If you need our prayers or if you need to be baptized, Please let your spiritual need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.